All right, so it's time for our final chapter on the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. And as most people know, this is the most famous or most popular chapter of the book of Ephesians because it talks about the armor of God. Um, now before we talk about that, uh, Paul is referring, when he's talking about the armor of God, he's referring to everything he's talked about already in the letter. So I think uh, it would be good to do a quick review of what the first five chapters were talking about. So it's fresh in our minds and then we'll go into the armor of God. Okay? So we'll start with the chapter 1. Jesus blessed us with adoption as children and he made known to us the mysteries of God. And he gave us an inheritance as God's children and he sealed us with the Holy Spirit. And Christ is at the right hand of God in heavenly places. And he's the head over all things to the church. So Jesus sits with God at the head of everything. He's the, the ruler and controller of everything. Okay, now in chapter 2, we learned of the prince of the power of the air who rules over the children of disobedience. Who are the children of disobedience? Unbelievers, those who do not believe in Jesus and uh, who do not believe in God. Okay, so what's the uh, difference between the prince of the power of the air and the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit is Ruach in Hebrew. It can mean breath or air or spirit. Okay? So the sp Spirit is a holy thing. It's, it's from God. It's, it's not a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. Um, it's something beyond the physical world. Air is like a spirit that is not beyond the physical world. It's, it's air, it's wind, it's, it's, uh, so I think when he's talking about the prince of the power of the air, it's like a, there's a Christ and an antichrist, or there's a spirit and an anti-spirit. It's like the, the air is like the air waves, uh, that carry radio, television signals, um, that this, this uh, entity or this group of people is able to influence many people through the power of the air, the physical world, where God influences many people through the power of the Spirit of God, which is in the people. So you see that there's a, there's a dual meaning here of uh, a physical meaning and a spiritual meaning. So I think that's uh, sort of a better understanding of what is the prince of the power of the air. It's, the, it's technology. It, it's uh, the... Um, that which is not God, which is a man, in uh, you'll find in the Hebrew prophets that this 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 enemy is a man. It's not God. It's not a God. It's a man, or a group of men. Okay, so they control the world through the power of the air, politics, uh, media what we have now. Okay, uh, and that, that power rules over the children of disobedience, the non-believers. 
because believers, even though they may listen to that power in the air and they may participate in it, in the media and somewhat, they're not ruled by it because they're ruled by something higher. They have higher ideals, higher teachings, okay? So uh, the believers sit together with Christ on the throne. We have the same authority that Christ has given us authority over the uh, things of the earth. Okay? And it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And uh, he made both one, the Remember the stick, Judah on the one side, the Jews, and Ephraim on the other side, which would represent Christianity in my understanding. And those two are joined together in one stick. Christianity under Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Okay? Uh, Christianity meaning the Gentiles. The Gentiles are welcomed into the family through Christianity. In, the Jews are born into the family. But they still need to connect with God because there's a lot of Jews that are not do not meet the mark. Um, that, you could see that all through the Bible. There's many Jews that failed, you could say. So just being born a Jew, it is, it doesn't, that's not good enough. Or just being born a Christian also is not good enough. You have to be a believer and you have to uh, have a relationship with God. Now, uh, so he made both one in Christianity and joined the Gentile believers with the Jewish believers. Okay. And we all have access by one Spirit to the Father, to, to God. And Christ is the chief cornerstone of the church. And we are all smaller stones building the church. And the church is a habitation for the Spirit of God, or for God. Okay? And in chapter 3, we see that the Gentiles become fellow heirs with the Jews, or with Israel. Uh, and the church, the job of the church is to make known the gospel to the principalities and powers. So the prince of the power of the air is using the principalities and powers of the earth to rule over men. The church's job is to preach the gospel to those principalities and powers and to make the gospel known to them that they may make their choice also whether they choose to serve God or to serve the prince of the power of the air. Okay? And, um, and also the mysteries of God. And Christ dwells in our hearts, and that strengthens the inner man within us. Okay? And then in, uh, in chapter 4, he talks about walking worthy of the calling that we are called to. And there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's not different ones. There's only one. And he also talks about the gifts of God to the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelizers, pastors, and teachers. And we are no longer children. And we ought to act as adults. Speak the truth in love. The Gentiles walk in vanity. And their understanding is darkened. Why? Well, if you look at um, Paul's time, for example, 
the it was quite common and quite well known that the Roman um, culture was built upon a system of these pagan deities and they had temples and different cities had temples to different pagan gods and that was kind of the power center of that area and the priests in those temples were very powerful and they demanded certain offerings or certain amount of money or certain things in order to appease the God for the people. And if you were seen upon as angering the God, the priests could turn the people against you. So this is the principalities and powers at work in Roman times. Now we also have principalities and powers in our time which is kind of a modification of what that was, okay? Um, so the way he's talking is the people who walk in darkness, because of these principalities and powers, it's darkening their understanding. It's pulling the wool over their eyes so that they can't see. And they're walking in darkness. And because of walking in darkness, there's a lot of lying, anger, and stealing, and thievery. Because uh, a lot of thieves don't even really understand what stealing is, or they don't know that they're stealing. They think it's just fair is fair for what they do when it's actually stealing. So there's things like that too, right? Where a Christian learns that, you know, all about stealing and all about some of these other sins that um, how you can kind of unknowingly get involved in some of this stuff and it's not good. Not good for you, not good for anybody else. So... Um, the Gentiles walk in this stuff, like even stealing from God, stealing um, understanding of people from God. God wants them to know how the world really works, but they're teaching them something else. That's stealing from God. So the stealing goes a, a lot further than just taking something out of a store without paying for it. Okay, and there's also lying. It's teaching the wrong things about God is lying. So, you know, that's how deep it goes. Um, Christians are called to be kind and tender hearted in all that they do. And in chapter 5, he talks about putting away all uncleanness in your own life. And do not be deceived by vain words. When people are talking vain things, meaningless things, uh, that they don't have understanding because their understanding is darkened, don't get deceived. So people are teaching Christian things too with their understanding darkened because their knowledge is not coming from God, it's coming from something else. Okay? And then uh, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness but rather reprove them. So point out the truth to them. And uh, whether they want to listen to it or not, that's their choice. But your job is to point it out. And the light makes all things manifest, and we are to shine the light and to talk truth in God. And we are to give thanks in all things, and then in the end of chapter 5, he talks about husbands uh, loving their wives and loving their children and wives loving their husbands and the family unit working together as a family as God's family works together. So the family of God is God is the father, we are the children, the church is the mother, um, and how that works so all things work together in the in the system that God 
intends. So now we're in chapter 6. So now we'll get into chapter 6 and, and we can refer back to some of these things we learned in the other five chapters as we learn to put on the armor of God. And why, do you, why would you put on armor? You put on armor because you're going to battle. You're, you're, you're in a fight. And when you start standing up for the truth, you do get um, opposition. So you have to be ready for it. And the, and the armor is uh, understandings and teachings and wisdom, uh, spiritual things that prevent the powers of darkness from overcoming you, from overcoming you in ideas and in your ideology and in your faith. Ephesians chapter 6 Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your mother and father, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you, and that you may live long on the earth. So this is a continuation. I don't know why they started chapter 6 here, but it's a continuation of the wives and the husbands and the children from the end of chapter 5 in Ephesians. And uh, this uh, is one of the Ten Commandments. You'll find that in Exodus chapter 20. And it says, Honor your father and your mother, that it may be well with you, and you may live long in the earth. So he's saying that that is the first commandment with a promise. So, uh, children, obey your parents. And that's good advice as long as you have good parents. Um, remember, this is talking about all things working as they should. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So, um, you know, if a father is punishing the children too harshly all the time, it just makes them angry. So bring them up in nurture and admonition, which is good advice. Now this part here, servants be obedient to your masters according to the flesh. Well, <clears throat> in Paul's time, slavery was a part of life. It was, it was quite normal in uh, probably most of the world that um, servants, there was masters and there was servants, and servants were owned, and they did, uh, there was domestic servants. They did like uh, household chores, and um, things like that, the shopping, the house cleaning, the cooking, the, the anything else that needed to be done. And, and in return, they were fed and housed. And so the master of the house would have servants. And that went on even into... Uh, uh, even into early America, like say in the Massachusetts colony, there was uh, indentured servants that was carried over from England. That um, when a young man would say become an apprentice, he became an indentured servant. Say he wanted to be a printer, he became a servant to the printer. And he would sign up for five years or however, however long of service. And he was housed and fed, but he lived like a servant. And he had to do everything he was told to do. And in the end, he would come out with the trade. He would know how to be a printer. So um, in, in any trade or farming or any kind of uh, learning to uh, have a skill was done in that way. So that was like a servant and a master relationship. 
but it was signed up for a certain period of time where in Roman times here it was a lifetime thing and a servant could buy himself out of uh, servitude by giving up his free time to earn money to buy himself from the master so it's just the way it was in those days today we can look at it like a employee employer relationship or a contractor and subcontractor or a, a business person and a customer the customer is paying money for a certain service and so the, the customer is the boss and you are doing this service for something in return so we can think of it that way now um, employee employer kind of relationship so uh, be obedient so be, be obedient to your boss according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart so you only don't have resentment and, and all kinds of other things in your heart about it you're doing a service and you, for, for money and you're being paid so do a good job as unto Christ just as if you were serving Christ for some reason for a service not with eye service as men pleasers but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart so take your job seriously uh, take it on as it was your own name being represented and do a good job with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men because God is watching you and you are representing God if you call yourself a Christian Okay, knowing that whatever good thing any man does, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. So whether you're a servant or a freeman, or whether you're a master, poor or rich, um, who anyone who does a good service will receive a reward from the Lord. And you masters, you employers, do the same thing unto them unto the servants or employees forbearing threatening don't threaten them and don't hold things over them knowing that your master is also in heaven neither is there respect of persons with him so just because you're a boss it doesn't mean God's going to treat you differently than he would treat a servant or an employee Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Okay, so now he says, finally, finally, my brothers. So now he's wrapping things up. He's gone through all these five chapters that we just kind of reviewed. And he's saying, finally, after all that, this is the end of his letter. Okay? He talked about the family, uh, children, wife, husband relationship, and he also talked about the servant master relationship. So, at uh, uh, your home and in your work, right? So, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, because we are seated with Christ, along with Christ. So, we are strong in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the adversary, the, the, that who stands against you. So be strong, put on the whole armor of God. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, and the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places so there is a as we talked about before in the book of Daniel 
you'll see there are spirits of certain regions or angels in charge of certain regions and maybe in charge of certain con continents or districts and it's just like politics and um, that these um, principalities and powers are represented by uh, government entities and uh, perhaps uh, political leaders whether they be good or bad you know we see a lot of uh, darkness in politics and uh, we see what happens we're seeing it a lot lately what happens when someone stands against it and how well, how low they are willing to go against somebody who stands against them okay Therefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, so all of it, not just one piece, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Now, we've got to remember where Paul is when he's writing this. He's in prison in Rome, facing a beheading. He was beheaded because he refused to worship the emperor as a god. That was the test. And he's waiting for this evil day when he's going to be given the choice to either worship or die. That's, that's his evil day. So uh, he's probably reflecting on this himself. And he's also telling the Ephesians who, who he's teaching to take on the whole armor of God because that evil day will probably come and you're going to have to make a stand. Stand therefore having your loins that's your your hips girt about or with truth. That's like the pants or the uh, um, to protect your your thighs in that area um, and it's also to cover your private parts and to, to uh, keep your dignity um, your, your wrapping of, around your waist and Truth is what does that for you. It keeps your dignity about you. And it keeps you covered that you are not standing there ashamed and naked. So if you lie, you are removing that covering. You're exposing yourself to shame. So that's the truth. The that's number one, is to keep your uh, covering of truth on. And having the breastplate of righteousness. So the breastplate is what goes on your chest, and that would uh, protect a, a soldier from frontal attacks. Um, so righteousness. Now righteousness goes along with truth. Um, and it's... it's uh, Righteous judgment and having a history of following the truth um, and not having anything to hide. So that is our breastplate. Is if you uh, don't participate in the lying, the stealing, and all the other things that go on in the world, then you have... Um, is something to protect you from attacks of such accusations. Uh, it goes along those lines. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So what did Paul talk about? Now feet to me, we're talking about something that is dual or something that is double. 
So this is the shoes on your feet that um, protect your path of where you're walking. And the preparation of the gospel of peace. So what is the preparation of the gospel of peace? Well, he talked about the two sticks. The stick that was broken and joined together in the prophecies that we spoke about. That was in chapter... Um, that was in chapter 2. So, understanding that uh, how we are called and how and who Christians are. It could be a Gentiles or Jews, and it's the people of the Abrahamic traditions that follow the Word of God that came all the way from the time of Moses unto now, unto the time of Christ. And those are the authoritative words that we live by and that we understand. So that's your feet, that's your path, and that's where you step and where you walk. Uh, that keeps your steps safe, and, and when you walk, it keeps you from stepping on something that will hurt you. It's following the Word of God and, and the Gospel of Peace. Okay? Above all, taking the shield of faith where are you able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked because they're always sending darts uh, accusations false accusations um, and the shield of faith protects you from condemnation so uh, that I am a child of God by faith not by what I do or don't do, but by my faith. So that's my shield. Is, is, you know, the fiery darts are accusations. Oh, you don't do this. You don't do that. You don't believe this. You don't believe that. Well, your faith is, the, is going to quench all of those darts. And it doesn't mean that you, there's, that you don't do anything. Or it doesn't mean that you don't have certain things that you follow, but those things do not protect you from the accusations. It's your faith that protects you. Don't say, yeah, I do these things. I do those things. I do it because this, that. No. It's, it's that I am a child of God because I believe. That's why. It's got nothing to do with the things I do. take the helmet of salvation so what's the helmet of salvation that protects your head that's your 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 control over your own self right the head controls the body so if they want to be your mind they want to tell you what you should do and what you shouldn't do for your salvation you need to have your own head on your own shoulders and read the Word of God and know yourself what, where your salvation stands. Let every man work out his own salvation before God. Right? So, the sword of the Spirit. Okay, so the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Okay, they go together, and they are the Word of God. You understand? So, um, that protects why you think you are saved. And the why you think you are saved is because of what you read in the Word of God. That you're working out your own salvation in the spirit of truth and righteousness. And the Word of God is your sword that when somebody tries to uh, attack you, you have an answer. You answer with the Word of God. You say, 
thus says the Lord, this whatever verse comes to you or whatever verse you're thinking of in this situation. So you have to learn to use your sword too. You, you read the word of God and there's certain, you'll see Christians do this often, there's certain verses that they have as like a, in their magazine ready to shoot at you <laughs> for certain topics. So you have your own too and you, you look up those things and you say, what are they talking about? Okay, if I don't believe they are correct, why don't I believe that? What verses am I going to have to say, I don't believe that you are correct because of this verse or because of this uh, certain uh, thing in the scriptures? And pray always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. So you have to be in the Spirit and have communication with God and pray with all prayer and supplication, watching with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So this is another principle to follow that the things that you do and the fight that you fight is not for yourself. It's for all saints. It's for the kingdom of God and for the church to prosper and to grow. So that should be the, the, the basis of all your prayers. And even the things you need for your personal life can be connected to that, that I need these things in order to help the church grow more. Because if I don't have what I need, how can I help other people have what they need? So everything is, is for this purpose, for all saints, for the kingdom of God. And for me, Paul, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly. Because so, he's still talking about meeting up against Caesar on that evil day when he's going to have to refuse. So this is what his concern is at the moment, sitting in a prison cell. Okay? That I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. So he's going to have to give an answer to Caesar. So he has to make known the mystery of the gospel. Obviously it wasn't listened to. and But I think that his prayer was answered because he has given utterance. He has been given utterance to make known the mystery of the gospel to far more than Caesar. The whole world knows the gospel because of Paul. for which I am an, amb an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly, without fear, standing in front of the Roman Emperor, ready to be beheaded, which you probably will be, and speak boldly as I ought to speak, so that God may give me the words that I ought to speak at that time. And that's quite um, a recurring theme for martyrs and for uh, through history of the uh, great people of God that when they did come up against uh, to answer in a court or up to defend their own life that they prayed very hard to speak what they ought to speak. And there's, some, there's some great examples in history of absolutely fabulous things that people spoke before they were uh, murdered. But that you also may know my affairs and how I do, Tychius, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, in the Lord shall make known to you all things whom I send 
to you for that purpose, that you might know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. Because everyone wants to know how Paul is and what's going on. So he's sending this uh, Tychius who was able to contact him. And he's sending him with this letter. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Written from Rome unto the Ephesians and sent by Tychius. Sent, carried by Tychius, basically. That concludes our video for today. I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next week. Don't forget to like share, subscribe to help us out with the algorithm. Thank you very much.